Okay. So, hyperscale computing. Um, before I get on to uh, the arm piece of the talk and the sort of level of detail on hyperscale, what I want to do is I want to talk about some trends uh, in the industry that we've been seeing for a number of years now. Um, for certainly the last five or ten years, uh, it's been readily apparent to anyone um, who's been observing what's been happening in the industry um, that we are reaching uh, single core performance limits. So in the history of computing, this, this graph um, is actually lifted from uh, Computer Architecture, uh, which is a great book. Recommend uh, anyone who's interested in computer architecture, uh, go read it. The fifth edition in particular is amazing. Um, what this graph shows is kind of at the dawn of the modern era of computing from 1978 onwards, um, growth in performance year on year was roughly 25%. And then we hit kind of this golden age of computing a few, uh, couple of decades back, where we have 52% performance growth year on year. So every, every year, um, improvements in silicon process, improvements in computer pipelines, um, optimizations, little uh, computer science hacks, um, all kinds of things at the hardware design level allowed us to get away with a 52% growth, which is awesome. I mean, this is why you're buying computers today that have the performance of a, su of a supercomputer from just a few years ago. Um, it it's phenomenal. And you have, um, at this point, cell phones in your pocket that are more capable than supercomputers at the beginning um, of this time period. Um, but that growth can only continue up to a point. There comes a time where um, silicon process improvements can only go so far. Feature sizes can only become so small. Um, we've already hit many of the optimizations with out-of-order execution, with um, superscalar architectures, with all these great concepts um, in computer hardware. And um, pretty much anyone who's been observing the industry um, in the last decade or so has noticed that um, you know, the gigahertz count on the um, systems you're buying uh, is not increasing like it was, right? We don't have 10 gigahertz desktop computers. We don't need 10 gigahertz desktop computers either, right? There's a certain level of how much performance do you actually need from your computer, um, and you probably don't need to have that level of uh, performance. So, but the single core performance limits are being reached, um, and what we're seeing uh, in recent times is a big push into multi-core. So you go and buy a system now, um, you know, if you, if you buy a cell phone or a tablet computer, what's the selling point? It's not how fast it is. What they say to you is it's a quad-core tablet computer. You know, and the average consumer looks at that and thinks quad sounds good, you know, four is better than one. You know, that's, that's really how it was with megahertz a few years ago, right? You go to a store and you buy something and it says it's two gigahertz. Oh, that's better than one gigahertz. That must be better, right? Um, so that's the latest kind of selling feature is that we're going multi-core, okay? And, and this year it's dual and quad core. Um, and in the coming years, you know, we're, we're getting to four, eight, 16, 32 cores and, and so on. That's in just consumer devices. Obviously, in enterprise hardware, we've had multi-core designs for a number of years now, um, and the trend there um, is to really see explosive growth in the, the core density. Um, at the same time, no matter what you're running in your computer, those individual cores um, are becoming simpler in design. Um, so if we scale out and we have 32 cores in a system, each one might be a little less complex than um, perhaps the single core computer you would have bought a few years ago. Um, but when you've got 32 of them, the level of performance you get with 32 cores dramatically outweighs um, the, the, uh, the cost of uh, simplification. Um, at the same time that we're seeing the trend towards multi-core computing, um, we're also seeing that data center energy costs are rising. So anybody here who is associated with you know, running a data center or running infrastructure, well, put your hand up if you're involved in you know, enterprise computing with data centers, right? I mean, I would say most of us here have, have some connection there, okay? So you guys are acutely aware of um, 
the HVAC infrastructure that you need, the heating, the ventilation, the cooling, the infrastructure that is associated with um, having all of these computer systems. And you're probably very much aware um, that energy use uh, is becoming uh, increasingly important. Certainly for the service that I personally have, um, I get emails from the guy that runs my little colo service, um, and he says to me, I don't care how much data you're using, I care how much power you're using. So, you know, for goodness sake, put a lower, uh, lower power supply in, in that system. Why is it taking so many watts, right? So, you know, I think even at the small scale, um, people care a lot more these days about how much energy they're using than perhaps how much data they're using. Um, so energy use is very important. Um, if you're in the European Union, um, or even in the US, you know, there's, there's a lot of concerns around um, carbon dioxide emissions um, and associated climate impact. And I think in particular in Europe where they're moving to a sort of carbon trading model um, of usage, um, you're seeing a direct economic cost there as well. Uh, as you use more energy, you use more infrastructure to generate that energy, um, it's at the same time costing you more to handle uh, that generation. So billing is being tied to energy use over data use. Um, and with that, we start to care a lot more about energy efficiency than just how fast our systems are running. So energy efficiency um, is one real takeaway I want you guys to have from this session today. So how do we measure energy efficiency? Well, one way we can look at that is in terms of performance per watt. So we can look at how much useful work can our computer system undertake for a certain amount of energy that we consume, okay? Um, what, how we might design a system, we may have many cores in the system. We may have you know, 32, 64, 128. When we have a very large number of cores, um, they could be um, individually consuming a, small amount, a smaller amount of energy. And at scale, um, we're consuming uh, we're in aggregate lowering the amount of energy that we're using in our computer systems. So rather than having you know, one system that consumes a large amount of power, we could scale that um, design out instead and choose to save energy in aggregate across a large number of uh, lower power systems. Now data centers measure something called power usage effectiveness, PUE. Um, now I cite Google here because um, they actually go as far as to publish their PUE um, almost in real time. So this is really a measure of overhead. You know, what is the um, infrastructure overhead of running your data center versus the amount of energy that you're using to run that data center? Um, 2.0 is a pretty good number in private industry today. That's really one watt of wasted energy for every watt of useful work that you get done, uh, which is uh, pretty unfortunate, but, but true in a lot of cases. Um, so Google published their stats, and the best they can achieve is 1.13, which is uh, phenomenal. Um, and decreasing that number in general is going to be uh, essential for gro growing the cloud beyond where it is today. So you know, we need to be looking at how are these guys, how are Google, how are Facebook, how are some of these big players um, designing their data centers to be more energy efficient, and what can we learn from, from those trends? So this is where the concept of hyperscale comes in. And what hyperscale is about um, is scaling out your infrastructure um, at an extremely high level of density. So in 142U rack, you might have 1,000 server nodes today in a hyperscale system, um, rather than you know, a few dozen blades that you might fit into uh, in an existing infrastructure. Again, performance is more a measure of how much aggregate performance can you get across the number of nodes that you have in um, that thousand node rack, not how much performance can you get out of each one individual uh, core or each one individual system. In order to achieve that level of density, you have to rethink how you design and build these systems. So, you know, your conventional server, you have a large amount of cooling, you have large power supplies, you have a large amount of overhead. You have a processor that's really beefy, really, really high end, using hundreds and hundreds of watts of power itself. You have to suck that heat away, put it somewhere. You have to get the energy in in the first place to drive it. 
There's a lot of overhead in running that. Um, we're already seeing data centers that are optimizing their airflow or running hot or you know, custom designing hardware to uh, better route the airflow through the system, this kind of thing. Um, but if we really kind of take that concept and think about it a bit more, um, what can we do uh, to, go the next, to, to go to the next level of density in our systems? Okay? If we're taking individual processors that are generating hundreds of watts of heat as they run, um, that's perhaps not the, the most efficient way to, to scale out to the density that we're looking for. So we need to reduce our energy consumption. Uh, in reducing our energy use, we will reduce the waste heat that we're generating. Um, reducing the waste heat reduces the heating and ventilation costs. Uh, doing all of these things overall will reduce the cost of running our infrastructure and running our computing facilities. So Google, Facebook, Open Compute, all of these guys are blazing a trail and setting some good examples that we can follow um, in the coming years uh, in the hyperscale computing space. So hyperscale really is about leveraging four key technology innovations. First one is system on chip. The second one is a fabric interconnect. Third one is integrated management. And the fourth one is heterogeneous systems technology. And I want to take a moment to talk through each of these different uh, four technology innovations. So system on chip. So those of you who are into computer history might recognize ENIAC, which was one of the first uh, computer systems uh, built uh, during World War II uh, to uh, tabulate ballistics tables. So when they were, uh, when the Allies were conducting uh, various bombing runs and, and all these things, they had to uh, calculate the, tra the uh, trajectory for various ballistics. And that's what ENIAC was built to do. It was not a stored program computer. It was uh, physically wired up each time uh, you needed to run some kind of calculation by using the plug boards that you can see on the left here. The operators would uh, determine a, a program. They would program the system by adjusting the plug boards. And that would take a, a number of days or weeks to program, um, and then days or weeks to run through the calculations. Um, the main thing about this is the size of the system. Right? This, is a, this, is, this is a building size computer. Um, and over the, over the years since then, we've moved, we've kind of taken that technology and we've, we've shrunk it down, right? So those of you guys who have seen the movie Sneakers, uh, great movie from the early 90s, will recognize this scene. This is uh, the, the, the good guy and the bad guy sitting there in the evil guy's lair, which is uh, his office and it has a crazy supercomputer sitting there they're sitting on and having this conversation uh, about world domination. And the thing, the thing about the Cray here is uh, it's kind of your 90s equivalent to, to the ENIAC. It's a, it's a room-sized computer, performs a, a, a very high level of calculation. Uh, it's much smaller than a building, but you're still looking at a room-sized computer. After that time, there's a trend into you know, more desktop computing that we saw in the 80s and 90s, uh, and then the kind of mobile computing that we're seeing today. And to really, to really kind of take the technology from this, from uh, the sort of desktop era, the desktop server era, and pull it into the mobile space that we're seeing today, um, we saw a, a key technology innovation, which is system on chip. And the thing about system on chip is you're taking all of those computing devices that you saw in the previous two pictures, uh, and you're combining them into a single chip. So whereas you might look at this diagram and you might think that you know, this, is, this looks like a circuit board with various different devices attached to it, um, it's in fact a single chip. It's a single piece of silicon uh, with all of these different devices integrated into it. So in this case, this is um, the Calzada energy core, which we'll come on to later in this presentation. Uh, the, the energy core has four processors. It has an embedded management engine. It has a cache, 
It has memory controllers, it has SATA ports, it has PCI Express, uh, it has uh, networking and fabric interconnects all built into one chip. And this is the kind of technology that we've seen in the embedded space over the last few years. This is why you have a cell phone in your pocket that is the size that it is. If we didn't have SOC, if we didn't have system on chip as a concept, uh, you would have to carry around uh, a briefcase sized cell phone, right? We back to the 80s, we, we'd have you know, giant phones we'd be carrying around all the time. The reason that you have the, the level of uh, integration that you're seeing in your mobile devices is because of system on chip. Now, if we take the system on chip concept and we move that into the server space, we start to talk about server on chip, which is really what this is here. Uh, we can combine not only the CPU, not only I.O. devices, but also GPU and GPGPU concepts all into one piece of silicon. And a complete server system can then be built from one system on chip part, some memory, and some storage. And in fact, over the coming years, uh, it's believed that we can take this to another level. So you currently have in your pocket a cell phone, most likely using something called package on package technology, which allows the designer to put the system RAM physically on top of the chip. It's kind of a three-dimensional stacking structure. Now, we can't yet embed enough memory in these designs to build a server system with many gigabytes of RAM. But it's only a few years until we can do that as well. So I think it will become possible in the next five years to have a single system on chip solution, which is your entire server stacked on top of that chip is the RAM and the flash storage. And then the level of density that you can achieve uh, is phenomenal. You've got a single SOC that's a matter of inches in size, uh, one inch square, let's say, on the board. That's your entire server. So system on chip is originally an embedded systems concept. It's now known as server on chip. The other thing that system on chip lets us do, um, if, if you're a uh, silicon company or if you're an OEM building server systems, the thing about system on chip is you can integrate all kinds of customized value. So one thing I'm gonna talk about is uh, embedding management controllers um, on, the, on the chip itself. You can also embed um, specialized peripherals and specialized offload engines. These may be sitting on a, what looks like a PCI bus, but they might not be. They, they might just be devices that um, your Linux system can, can use directly that are embedded into the chip. And we're already seeing some work there for you know, cryptographic offload, fast hashing functions, these kinds of features. As I mentioned, package on package will allow us to stack these different parts onto one chip. And we'll be able to integrate an entire system uh, into merely a few inches of space. The second innovation that I want to talk about for hyperscale is fabric connectivity. So this image here uh, is a historical US Air Force uh, telephone plug board, okay? Um, you guys have all probably seen old videos of uh, telephone exchanges from back in the day. To make a phone call, you spoke to an operator, usually very friendly. Uh, you asked them to put you through to somebody. They pulled out a plug put it into the other, spoke to the person on the other end, said, hey, is this Bob? No. Oh, sorry, wrong line. Hey, is this Bob? Yep. Okay, good, we've got the right guy. And then you connect the call together. Um, why is this interesting? This is interesting because we haven't really, in spite of all the other innovations in our lives, we haven't really gotten very far from this in our modern data center, have we? If you look at the modern data center, you look at the racks of equipment you have in your modern data center, you have this spaghetti maze of cabling. Any of you who've racked up a server in, in recent times have, have seen this. You've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of network cables coming out and going here and going here. And it's, 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 a, it's a true form of art. If you go on uh, Flickr or any of these websites in Google for data center spaghetti cable, you'll find some people have taken some phenomenally exciting photographs of the, the, the true level of insanity that you can create by wiring up all these different devices. 
Though it's really not very, not very far removed from this. Now, this is antiquated and old, right? Why is it we have to have all these different network sockets and all these different connections to these switches? Why do we have so many switches in our rack of servers? Why do we have those switches connected to other switches, connected to routers? There's a crazy level of complexity there. And that's even before you get into redundancy. Now, if you want redundancy, you then have to start duplicating all of these connections. Then you have to have your backup switch here, and then you've got to have your failover. It's crazy. So if we're rethinking how we build server systems, at the same time, why don't we rethink how we connect them together? So what we can do is we can integrate something called Fabric into our entire system design architecture. What we can do is we can build, at the rack level, a complete solution. All of the systems in that rack are attached to a single coherent fabric. They communicate together. They exchange data. They have networking between them. But there's no physical connections that you have to worry about. You've got redundancy built in. You've got fabric controllers built into this system. You don't have to worry about uh, spaghetti wiring messes and this kind of stuff. So what does fabric connectivity really bring us? Well, it brings us a transparent interconnect between all of the systems in our rack. They don't have these physical cables. They're connected at a virtual and logical level. There's no physical network ports to plug between different systems. And we get redundant paths and routing optimizations built in. So each of these servers likely has many possible connections it can make to other servers. If a particular network path has a problem, it's congested or it's failed, we have built in redundancy. We can switch. We can handle all of this, and you don't ever have to worry about plugging cables together. Instead, what you see is a single or perhaps several uh, network ports for your entire rack. You know, we'll give you, a, we'll give you a number of 10 gig connections for the entire rack. That's all you have to worry about at your data center. And between the individual nodes in this rack, we'll use IO virtualization and modern networking technologies uh, to replace the top of rack switching um, and all of the cabling mess. Now, the other thing we can do with this is we can obviate the need for one-to-one -one storage. So if you put 1,000 systems into a rack, you don't want to give each one of those 1,000 systems its own disk. That's, that's, that's going to be insane uh, as we start to grow the density. We have 10,000 systems in a rack. Do you want to have 10,000 disks in there? That's, you know, there's a point at which this doesn't make sense. So over the coming years, I think we're going to see a transition um, towards you know, I.O. virtualization, storage virtualization, storage aggregation across the fabric. These individual systems will see disks, but those disks may be aggregated and dispersed over the fabric. The third thing I want to talk about related to hyperscale is failure in place. So how do you maintain 1,000 systems that are in a rack? And the answer is, maybe you don't. So this image you see here is from a guy called Bunny. He's uh, kind of an open source hardware hacker type, goes to uh, Maker Fair and these other events, often talks about OLPC and other gadgets. Um, this is a close-up shot uh, of an OLPC, one laptop per child uh, device that runs, actually runs uh, Fedora, uh, runs Linux. Here you can see individual pixels on the screen. Now, when you buy a laptop, whether it's an OLPC or a regular consumer laptop or a tablet computer, if one of those pixels on that screen fails, We've generally become accustomed to the idea that you know, we don't care about one bad pixel. Okay? There might be a rule that we don't care about three bad pixels. Some of us have had this whole issue where we, we buy a shiny new laptop, and it has a couple of bad pixels. And you go back to the store, and you say, hey, you know, I, I just spent $2,000 on this laptop. What can you do for me? And they say, well, it's less than five, so we're not going to do anything for you at all. Um, you know, so we've, we've all had that kind of experience. Um, other experiences that we've had are um, with storage technologies. You've all probably experienced bad blocks on your disks. And I think we've become accustomed to the idea that 
disks are not perfect. A certain number of bad blocks in our disks uh, are acceptable. There comes a point where you have more than a threshold of bad blocks, and then you say, okay, maybe this disk is not mechanically sound, or maybe this flash has some underlying problem. If it's a flash technology storage device, a certain number of erasable flash blocks might have failed. And you're okay with that because you're accustomed to the idea that you know, flash is not perfect. If you have a thousand servers in Iraq, why should all of those thousand servers be perfect? And if one of those servers fails, do you really need to send out a maintenance engineer to come and take a card out and put another card in and all this stuff? Probably not. The, the model that we'll probably move to in the coming years um, is to let those systems fail in place, like bad pixels on a screen or bad disk blocks. Um, when a certain number of those have failed, then we come back to whether we should uh, swap out parts of the system and replace them. The fourth thing I want to talk about with hyperscale is integrated management. Each of the system on chip parts can integrate management features. So not only do you have a, a, a new level of density, a new level of scale, but each of these devices can be very, very uh, feature rich. You can use IPMI to provision them. You can have security built in, secure boot, all of these different kinds of features. You have fabric connectivity built in, and you have value add opportunities for OEMs and vendors. So if you have management features built into every single chip, um, there's all kinds of value that you can add there. I think over the coming years, provisioning will move to more of an injection-based model. So what will happen is you won't boot a 1,000 servers and then have them go off like what we in computer science would call a thundering herd. You won't have all these 1,000 servers boot and they all say, hey, I need to get my system image right now. And then the infrastructure says, no. Um, that isn't what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen instead is um, you're gonna turn that system on exactly when you want to provision it. And because you've got a management controller built in there, you're gonna inject the exact operating environment. You're gonna push it directly into that system. And you're gonna have direct control over it. It's not gonna sit there and pull and pull and say, hey, do you have something for me yet? No, you're gonna push it in there. Uh, and by having an injection model, you have a lot more control as well. Now, we'll need to build infrastructure. We'll need to build software to be able to provision these systems. But this is the model that I think we're moving to. Okay, so another feature of hyperscale that's emerged recently is the concept of heterogeneous systems. Um, now, those of you in the room here have probably seen AMD announce something called HSA in the last few weeks. Um, this is one implementation of the concept, and I'm sure there'll be others as well. The idea, broadly speaking, is that you can have computationally agnostic designs. You take the system on chip concept, um, you might have an x86 chip with various devices built into it. It might be an ARM chip. Um, on there, you might have GP GPU features. You may have all kinds of different features. You may build systems where you have some x86 chips, you have some ARM chips, kind of this mix, uh, mix and match. Um, this is the concept of heterogeneous systems, and I think it's a very new, very exciting, uh, very cool technology. Um, and by doing this, you can also kind of play with both raw megahertz and low energy designs. You could have some, some uh, chips that are very, very high performance, some that are very low energy, all in one system chassis. For deploying hyperscale systems, I think the model at least for now, uh, is gonna be uh, very similar to how we deploy virtual machines today. So you'll have physically targeted appliance images, very much like you would install virtual guests, but the image you're installing is more a physical target image that gets put onto the bare metal hardware. There may be some virtualization, uh, mostly for uh, lightweight management. And the systems will be frequently reprovisioned depending on the workload. The kind of workloads we're seeing already in hyperscale are you know, web tier, big data, analytics, all of these spaces where you need to have um, a lot of 
a, a very high density amount of computing happening in a small space. Um, and you may need to reprovision these different nodes very quickly. Again, you'll use an injection model to solve the thundering hood problem of how you will uh, manage having 1,000 nodes in a given rack. So I'll check on how we're doing for time. Okay. So I want to come on to um, the ARM piece of this presentation. Now, ARM pioneered both system on chip um, and low energy computing in many ways. Um, everyone in this room pretty much either has or has used an ARM based device. If you have a cell phone here, the odds are 90% that your cell phone has an ARM chip in it right now. Um, historically, ARM has not been very much uh, associated with the server space, but that's changing. And we'll come on to some interesting examples of that in a few minutes. ARM is a licensing model that allows anybody to make an ARM chip. So you don't buy a chip from ARM. You buy a chip from Calzada, or you buy a chip from Samsung, or you buy a chip from Texas Instruments, or you buy a chip from one of these other companies that have licensed um, the design from ARM. From ARM, you can license both the ARM architecture and implement it yourself from scratch, or you can implement uh, an ARM-provided design. So you've got a lot of diverse options there. In the first quarter of this year, four billion, with a B, ARM cores were shipped. Not all in servers and cell phones. Some of them were in little embedded gadgets like my little Fitbit that I used to track my steps. But four billion devices is, uh, is a very compelling, uh, very compelling number. So the ARM architecture is incredibly popular already, even before it starts to move into server systems. The level of offering they have today is currently a 32-bit architecture, 40-bit uh, uh, Memory addressing is coming over the next year. And in the next couple of years, we're going to see 64-bit ARM systems. If you go to, uh, to buy an ARM system, you'll hear lots of terms. Uh, I suggest if you really want to read up on that, that you take a look at Wikipedia. It has some good articles uh, sort of demystifying the different names. You'll hear words like Cortex for the 32-bit ARM chips that are currently out there. You'll start to hear words like Atlas that describe the 64-bit architecture implementations from ARM. Um, the Cortex family is used in designs like Calzada's Energy Core that I'm going to be describing. And there are some others who implement their own custom designs. So folks like Marvell historically have implemented their own designs. And they do that because they can leverage some optimization techniques by doing the work from scratch. Now, in the Fedora space, we're very excited about ARM technology. Um, we've been working on a port to the ARM architecture in the Fedora space for a number of years now. This is um, true community-powered innovation with Red Hat support. So it's a combination of both Red Hat employees, like myself, um, and community members, like Peter Robinson, who's sitting here in the front row. Um, we all work together in the Fedora space to bring uh, Fedora to the ARM architecture. Now, we've just released Fedora 17 for ARM. You can go and download it, put it onto your ARM-powered device, and you have a full Fedora 17 experience. We have two flavors that we release. One is for older devices, like the Raspberry Pi that's incredibly popular and 25 bucks, so anybody can go buy one, right? It's awesome. Kids can go, you know, pretty much anybody can find 25 bucks and go buy themselves an ARM computer to experiment. And they can put Fedora on that. And that's fantastic. Newer devices, based on the latest and greatest processor designs, use a slightly uh, different version that we have uh, of Fedora 17. Those include some of the emerging servers um, that you're going to be seeing over the next few months and the next couple of years. ARM is currently a secondary architecture in Fedora. That means it's very similar to PowerPC or System 390 mainframes in the, the level of uh, status in the project. And what we're trying to do is transition over the next year or two uh, into becoming a primary architecture on par with x86. 
Uh, in the Fedora area this week, we have a number of demos. We've got servers, we've got embedded devices, we have a Raspberry Pi if you guys want to come see that. If you bring the USB stick bottle opener that they gave you when you registered, we can give you a free ARM emulator and you can run the Fedora ARM release on that as well. Also, feel free to ask us any questions. Uh, we are experienced developers and we have opinions. Time check. 20 minutes, okay. So, what's Red Hat doing in all this? Well, we have an ARM team. And the ARM team within Red Hat is working to assist the Fedora ARM project to enable the ARM architecture in the Fedora space. We are collaborating with early ARM server vendors uh, currently in the Fedora space. We're trying to make sure that Fedora runs just really, really well uh, on designs such as uh, Calzada's uh, energy core that's used in the emerging HP servers. Um, and we're trying to lay some groundwork for the future 64-bit technology. We've got no product plans to announce at this time, but we're always interested in new and emerging technologies. And if the ARM architecture goes in the direction that we've been seeing, I would hope that uh, plans can change in coming years. One of the key things Red Hat brings to the table is that we really understand the enterprise server market. Uh, today's PC-based server market is a commodity server market. There's a lot of standards there that mean that you can just go buy a server and install an operating system such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux on that server. What we need to do is to collaborate with those in the ARM space to ensure that the emerging ARM servers have a very similar experience in the enterprise. So I sometimes get criticized for using the word zoo to describe the ARM space. Historically, that's been a little bit true. There's been a lot of diversity. Diversity is a good thing. It encourages innovation, it's wonderful. Controlled diversity can be a good thing too. So just a little bit of control there, making sure that where there's no value in differentiating, that we don't try to do that. So there's, there's no value in having 20 different ways to plug a serial cable into a device. But there might be value in having different GP, GPU offload engines. So let's move the value where it makes sense. Let's standardize the basics and let's work together uh, in that. And Red Hat is actively engaged in steering those efforts. So onto HP Moonshot. I don't think it escaped anyone's attention that a few months ago, HP announced a project called Moonshot. This is a photo of uh, an HP Redstone ARM server sled, which has the Calzada Energy Core uh, based SOC installed, which I'll describe in a few moments. This is a very, very high density system. You've got 288 individual server nodes in a 4U space. It's a very, very high level of density that you can achieve already today using a server that HP have produced. So what is Moonshot? Moonshot is a multi-year effort to drive low energy innovation. What HP is trying to do here is really, truly learn how to build hyperscale systems. So HP make really great servers already, but like anybody else, what they're trying to do is really understand the hyperscale emerging technology uh, space. The current design is architecture agnostic. So HP have also announced that they are uh, working on x86-based designs. And that's just great, because what we need here is a vibrant ecosystem of different opportunities. We need to have uh, system-on-chip-based hyperscale designs that have x86 and ARM parts all working together, um, getting trade-offs, getting the market to do its thing, uh, and to drive innovation forward. What HP have announced is the Discovery Labs, which will host the first HP Redstone server systems. And we're gonna make sure that Fedora uh, is running in the Discovery Labs, and that anybody who wants to come and try uh, an HP Redstone server system running Fedora has an opportunity to do that. Now, the HP Redstone server is powered by the energy core chip from Calzada. Now, Calzada is a server chip company 
funded by ARM and a number of others. What they have is a low energy server on chip design. It's currently a quad core chip. Each one of these on the energy card here, each of these is an energy core. Each of these is a quad core chip. As you can see on this, on this photo, each of these is a complete server system. There are SATA ports next to this design. So each one of these can have its own storage, its own memory, that's a complete server. In each sled in the rack unit, you have a number of these energy cards lined together. That's how you get the kind of density that we're already seeing. And this is just the beginning. Now each one of the energy cores uses only five watts, including the fabric. So it's a very, very low energy design compared to your multi-hundred watt uh, existing server technology that you're seeing deployed today. It was chosen by HP for use in HP Redstone. And I'd just like to put a call out here. Calzada is working amazingly well with the open source community, and we're really excited with that. Would you like to see one? I've got one hiding out here. So this, this is a Redstone server, part of Project Moonshot. You guys can come and take a look at this running uh, in the Fedora booth um, after the presentation today. Uh, and anytime tomorrow, you can come see it running. Let's give a demonstration. Brendan, do you want to, my trusty assistant, is going to come up here. Now, why am I wearing the cycling jersey? and the shorts. If it, isn't, if it hasn't become apparent to anybody yet, I thought we couldn't really do a low energy computing demo without doing a low energy computing demo. <laughs> so, is it powering up? Inverter's on? Inverter's on? All right, let's switch to the, uh, so uh, let me just describe the demonstration that's gonna be booting here and then switch, the, don't switch display yet. Let's go back to the other display. Yep. All right, so this uh, HP Redstone server system has 32 ARM server cores. It's pre-production hardware right now. Each one is five watts. And what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be showing you a Mandelbrot set visualization using OpenMPI. Now, you know, those of you who are interested in math know about uh, Benoit Mandelbrot. He came up with the Mandelbrot set back in 1975. He saw the first visualization of the Mandelbrot set in 1980 uh, at the uh, IBM uh, Thomas Watson Research Center. Um, and ever since then, uh, supercomputing demos or anything involving scale has tended to involve some kind of Mandelbrot demo, uh, in this case using OpenMPI. So this is the standard OpenMPI Mandelbrot demo that we're gonna be running here. And uh, it's running on Fedora 17, built for the ARM architecture. It's a standard, completely standard release of Fedora 17. So let's switch to the other display. Okay, so now you can see how many watts I'm producing. Let me just crank it up a little bit here. All right, let's get this workout going. Is the inverter on? The light, is it lit? The light's on? All right. So the way this demo works is um, this bike is charging a battery. And it's a small battery. It's just for smoothing to make sure that if I stop pedaling, the server doesn't lose power immediately. I'm currently only generating about 25 watts. That's because the battery is largely full. I charged it before. So I'm just trickling, trickle charging it right now. Hence you can see the fan is running. The fan is my diversion load when I generate too much power. That's why the fan is currently blowing and cooling me down. Now if you guys come and see this demo, you can try it out. If you generate too much power, you'll turn the fan on to cool you down. And if you start cranking it up,
So you can get up to about 100 watts on this. Uh, it's a lot more easy when the battery is uh, less full of juice and the fan is not running. And you actually have some load it's resisting. Otherwise, it becomes very easy to pedal right now. Is it booted? Let's do it. Yeah, let's run the Mandelbrot. Okay, so we're going to do a single core Mandelbrot rem uh, render first. It's going to be pretty slow. That's kind of slow. That's if we run one core with 10,000 iterations. Okay, let's kill that before we have to end the session. Let's go to 32 cores. All right, it's just initializing. And there you go. Much faster. Now, each of those lines interleaving there was a single core doing part of the render, sending it back. And Brendan is now going to just navigate through parts of the Mandelbrot to show you how much faster it is. We have the 32 cores doing the render. So if anyone here is interested in trying this out, all you have to do is come by the Fedora area. You can get on the bike, and you can pedal power your very own ARM server. Should you shut it down before I have to pass out? <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right, so I think it's time for a prize. Can we get the raffle bowl brought in? Am I off? OK, can we get the raffle uh, bowl brought in? Can you mind bringing it down? Let's, uh, let's give away an ARM system to someone here. All right. Remember, Red Hat employees are exempt. But if, if you are a Red Hat employee and you want some ARM hardware and you haven't already spoken to me, Come be my friend. Let's get you uh, hooked up with whatever you need. All right. A little bit panty here. Sorry about that. Didn't get my run in yet today. All right. So ticket number 9152. Five, I know. It's sad. I know. It's really sad. Uh, six. Who has that? You? Excellent. You just won yourself. <laughs> Round of applause. You just won yourself. Beagle Bone, which is a fully capable arm system. Let's get a picture of you holding it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Let's get a smile at Andreas here. Let's get a picture of you, sir. Very cool, Eric. Right, thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Yeah, uh, here's your here's your box, and uh, let's uh, drop me a line. Uh, I will give you a business card afterward, and we'll get you the installation instructions so right, you cool. can right, thank you. get it get it going. <laughs> yeah, who needs manuals, right? <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Uh, those of you who want to find out more about the the ARM project uh, in the RHEL roadmap session, there will be links to. Uh, the Fedora ARM project. If you want to go and try Fedora ARM for yourself, come see us. We can give you a free emulator. Or just Google Fedora ARM. It's the first link you see. Go there. Tell it what you have. It will tell you how to install it on whatever device you have right now. Thank you very much. And before we finish, uh, the Summit Cup game check-in code for this session is 2591. <laughs>